Tonight, I will try to make two points. One, that value investing makes sense, and the other, that value investing works over time. Um, now, your value investing, it's a, it's a big tent, which accommodates many different people. Indeed, there are no, because value investors are independent, are free spirits, and uh, follow their own path, march to their own drummer, there are no two value investors who are alike. The, um, uh, the, um, at, at, at one end of the, so it, it's a, as I said, it's, it, it's a big, big tent. At one end of the tent, there is Benjamin Graham, the founder of the value school in the 1930s, who then proceeded to publish in 1949, The Intelligent Investor, which Warren Buffett himself says is the best work Best, best book ever written about investing. Now, some other people have written books about investing which are worthwhile. Seth Carmen, uh, although it's out of print, uh, published uh, Margin of Safety in 1991. And Marty Whitman published a number of books, including the last one, which he did with Fernando Diz of the uh, Syracuse University, um, which is called Modern Security Analysis and which was published in 2013. But the truth is, the great majority, almost nine books out of 10 about investing, are not, are not worth the paper they're putting on. Indeed, many of them are quite misleading. The, um, there are 20 chapters, as you know, to intelligent investor, to the intelligent investors, investor. Uh, I would like to speak to, I, I would like to mention three ideas to which it seems to me that, and all of the 20 chapters are interesting, but I would like to mention um, you know, three. Uh, I would like to mention three sides of uh, Ben Graham's um, approach. It seems to me that Ben Graham speaks to a number of ideas in the book, but particularly to the idea of humility, the idea of uh, caution, and the idea of order. The idea of humility. Whenever uh, Ben Graham was asked, what do you think will happen to company X or company Y or company Z, he used to deadpan, the future is uncertain. And that sounds obvious, uh, only God knows and he ain't telling, but the truth is that there are lots of people on Wall Street or elsewhere who will tell you that on October 10, 2014, the Dow Jones Index Industrials will be at 19,254 you'll be lucky if they don't provide you with the decimals. And of course, that's nonsense. Um, the, the second idea is the idea of caution, precisely because the future is uncertain. There is a need for caution, a need for what Graham called the margin of safety, the cushion. The, um, indeed, in chapter 20 of The Intelligent Investor, Graham says, writes that the margin of safety is a secret of good investment. And he uh, mentions uh, real estate bonds in the 20s that were issued at par. In the 30s, quite a few of them defaulted, and the price went down to 10 cents or less. And Graham called them reasonably safe for, for the true values he believed were four or five times the 10 cents. At the same time, uh, Graham um, says, writes that uh, uh, because the future is uncertain, the margin of safety, safety is not a guarantee of profit, hence the need for diversification. And finally, uh, you know, Graham speaks to, uh, to the idea of order, the idea that securities are or can be much more than simply pieces of paper to be traded in and out of based on market psychology that there is such a thing as the intrinsic value of a business. Graham sometimes called it the central value, and accordingly, um, that there is such a thing as the intrinsic value of a security. It's not a recipe. It's not a black box. Uh, it's not a formula. It's sometimes difficult to, um, to establish the intrinsic value of a security. Mistakes are made, inevitably. Uh, but at least it's an approach that takes into account human nature. And that's where Graham talked about Mr. Market as the collective of investors and traders and speculators. 
who buy and sell uh, securities. Um, and Mr. Market says Graham is at times over-optimistic, i.e. greedy, and at times over-pessimistic, i.e. fearful. In the, 60, in, in the 1960s, admittedly, many, uh, at, in many universities, and particularly the University of Chicago, some academics came up with the efficient market, with the theory which, of, of the efficient market hypothesis. The, um, the idea that investors are rational in their behavior um, and that all the news concerning a particular business are immediately reflected in the price of the stock. The, uh, in, a way, um, in a way, those academics, uh, it seems to me, deny uh, human nature. Uh, the, uh, and, and a number of uh, books have been written in recent years by so-called behavioral uh, um, professors who point, who point out, as, as Graham did, that you know, Mr. Market sometimes, uh, that uh, people are not rational in their, uh, many people are not rational in their, in their investments. The, um, if, if, if the academics had, had bothered to to read uh, Graham the Intelligent Investor, they probably would not have come up with their, uh, with their efficient market hypothesis. Um, indeed, if one uh, questions, as I do and as others do, the efficient market hypothesis, one ends up probably questioning the entire capital asset pricing model, which of course uh, creates tension within some universities where it's uh, it's taken as, uh, as the truth. The, at the other end of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the tent, of the value tent, there is Warren Buffett, who was a student of Graham, who worked for Graham for a while and then went out on his own and made considerable and successful adjustments to the teachings of Van Graham. The, um, and those adjustments, uh, you know, can be seen when I, uh, I first uh, discovered Van Graham in 1968 on my first trip to New York because I was spending, I was bicycling uh, in Central Park on weekends with two French, French students at Columbia Business School. Their interest was not investing, it was marketing, but they, they know that, knew that my interest was investing and they mentioned the name of Van Graham and as luck would have it, I went into a bookstore and bought The Intelligent Investor. The, um, and then, 10 years later, when I, uh, after a few years in Paris, uh, when I came back to New York, I discovered the, uh, the um, uh, letters to shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway, and very quickly I got the past 10 annual reports, and, uh, and, and I could see that uh, um, now, you know, sometimes uh, – there are issues, other issues, other th that have nothing to do with value investing, which Buffett, uh, well, or, or something, but indirectly to do with value investing, which uh, uh, Buffett likes to discuss. For instance, he is the one who, apropos stock options, pointed out that, hey, it's a cost, it's, it's a cost of doing business, and accordingly, the cost of stock options should be reflected in the earnings per share of the companies. And he faced major opposition from the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley and their lobbyists in Washington who uh, denied that uh, it should be considered as a cost of doing business. And indeed, some of them even uh, alluded to the idea that it was unpatriotic to question the fact that uh, stock options were not accounted for in the earnings per share of a business. Until finally Congress, uh, you know, saw the light and uh, and now uh, the, the cost of stock, op stock options is accounted for in the, uh, in the earnings per share of the business. I mean, sometimes you do yourself, uh, you know, one uh, presumably intelligent people uh, question, like the entrepreneurs of Silicon Valley and some of their lobbyists and some of the congressmen, question what seems to be evident. Are they simply idiots? It's a mistake to consider that they're, they're smart. Or are they in bad faith? Most of the time they're in bad faith. The, um, um, with, with both Buffett and Graham, the quantitative, in other words, the numbers, are all important. It starts with the numbers. 
which means starts with public information. Uh, in the U.S., you know, the annual report, the 10-K, the 10-Qs, the, pro the proxy statements, etc., and also the footnotes to the financial statements. Indeed, if somebody, if, if, the, if the buyers of Enron, when Enron was riding high before the fall, had bothered to read the, 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 the footnotes to the financial statements, one of them, I know because uh, somebody at Arnaud and Les Brashwater had, had moved from uh, working for a French bank to working for a medium-sized securities firm, Arnaud and Les Brashwater, uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, and um, uh, and the, um, 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 and, 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 and somebody at Arnold and Blackstraw said, hey, did we look at Enron? Because that individual had, had seen a, an article about Enron that was very positive. And one, I, I asked one of our in-house analysts to, um, to look at Enron, and very quickly he came across the, the, the footnote that was incomprehensible. Uh, and so he called, you know, one, one advantage of, uh, of size, there are disadvantages to size in, the money, size in the money management business, but one advantage of size is that when you pick up the phone and call the chief financial officer or even the chief executive officer, he will, he, he will pick up the phone at his end. And so my in-house analyst talked with the chief financial officer or one of his lieutenants, I don't remember, and, and said, hey, will you explain to me that footnote? And, and, and the fellow was extremely evasive, and so I said, hey, you know, take the annual report and all the public information, throw it into the wastebasket, and let's move on to something else. I mean, we, we, are, we are not going to go into the quantitative if the quantitative is not uh, satisfactory. The, um, but then, and even though there are some aspects of Ben Graham in the intelligent investor that, that allude to the quantitative, Ben Graham was mostly about numbers. Uh, Buffett introduced the qualitative in a major way, uh, looking for businesses with a sustainable competitive advantage, what Buffett calls a moat. Now, that's uh, something that requires the exercise of judgment, much more than, uh, than, um, much more than the Ben Graham uh, approach. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, I for one, I'm not as smart as Warren Buffett, so the odds that I will err in my judgment are much greater than, than the odds that he, he will himself. So the, the Buffett approach has to be, um, has to be handled, you know, very carefully. The, um, uh, and on top of that, it's much more time consuming, but poten potentially much more rewarding than the Graham approach. Indeed, Buffett, many years after Graham passed away in 1976, characterized the Graham approach as the cigar butt approach, whereby, um, you know, you identify sometimes with, with Graham based on, on balance sheet numbers, you identify an intrinsic value at 50, you buy the stock at 30, uh, if the stock is at 30, you buy it, you sit on it uh, patiently, and if it moves to 45, you start selling, and by 50, it's all over, and you move on to something else. It's like a cigar butt because you get one good puff to move from 30 to 45, although that's a jolly good puff, and then it's all over. Um, the, um, uh, now, the quantitative, um, I, I've helped, uh, I've helped uh, teach a few courses at Columbia Business School on value investing. And the, the attitude of some of the students is we, we have to, to know everything about a business. And I try to convince them that, but it's not easy, that uh, what's important is to try to figure out the four, five, or six, usually it's not more than that, major strengths and weaknesses of the business. And that they can safely ignore the rest, which is truly trivial. Of course, the risk is that they will miss one of the major strengths or one of the major uh, weaknesses. Um, but um, uh, so the trick is not, is not to miss that. Now, uh, the, um, indeed, I mean, there was a case uh, two decades, two, more than two decades ago, where uh, you, only have, you only had to identify one thing. It was a case for the forest products and paper uh, industry 
uh, yeah, 25, 30 years ago, where, in fact, the only thing you had to keep in mind was that it, it was two businesses. One was the ownership of Timberland, which was a very good business, uh, and the other was the processing of the timber into lumber, plywood, pulp and paper, which was a terrible business. The ownership of uh, Timberland is, is a very good business because, you know, it's a renewable resource. Nature does the work for you. The forests grow by a certain amount every year. It's the, it's the very different from a copper or, or a gold mine, which is a wasting asset, and if the company wants to continue to operate, they have to come up with another copper mine or another gold mine. Uh, number two, uh, most forest product companies today, not throughout the world, but certainly in the U.S., operate on what they call a sustained yield basis. In other words, you don't cut down, uh, when you harvest uh, the timber, you don't cut down more than the natural growth of the forest, which means that at the end of the year, you have the exact same amount of timber uh, you know, in the forest as you had at the beginning of the year. It's not capital intensive, so it creates a tremendous amount of free cash flow. And finally, over the past century, um, the, the value of, uh, the market value of timber and timberland has more than kept up with, with inflation. Uh, the processing of the, of, of timber is a terrible business because it requires expensive machinery. Uh, it's a commodity business that's subject to price competition. Your, your lumber is not going to be any better than the lumber produced by somebody else. And, but at the time, the forest products and paper companies in the U.S. were run by engineers. And there is nothing an engineer like better, likes better than a brand new shiny machine. So what they did was subsidize the processing of the timber with the tremendous cash flow generated by the ownership of Timberland, so that over a full cycle, the profits were quite mediocre. Um, and then uh, Dave Swanson, who runs the Yale Endowment, who is a very smart man, and Jeremy Grantham figured out that Timberland was an alternative asset of, of, of interest, and at a time when there was very little interest for Timberland, they started buying forests. Uh, 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 Dave Swenson started buying forests for the uh, endowment of Yale. The, um, uh, we cannot buy physical, in mutual funds, we cannot buy physical assets, really, with exceptions, and certainly not Timberland. Um, uh, but there were a few companies, Plum Creek and Rayonier among them, who came to the conclusion 20 or 25 years ago that, uh, as I was saying, you know, it was two businesses and the processing of timber was, of, uh, of, uh, was a terrible business. So they got rid of most, if not all, of their uh, uh, timber processing. Uh, and they concentrated on, um, on the ownership of timberland. Incidentally, it's not just the ownership of timberland because, uh, for instance, there is a uh, company uh, by the name of Pope Resources which owns uh, timberland within 50 miles of Seattle, which means that some of the timberland is sold to real estate developers at uh, market values that are superior to the market values uh, if, if it were si simply uh, a piece of land where to um, harvest timber. The, uh, so there is a real estate side to, to the ownership of some of that uh, timberland. Um, so we and a few others started buying some of those stocks uh, at a discount to the uh, to the value of the of the timberland, um, uh, and we did the same thing with real estate operating companies as as opposed to real estate investment trusts. The uh, Marty Whitman, we and a few others, we ignored the real estate investment trusts as they appeared because the, the, the people who are interested in real estate investment trusts are, are people who are interested in the yield. And indeed, there has been quite a few instances over the years where the, um, the, 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 the stocks, the securities were selling at a price that was at a premium to the value of the physical, to the then value of the physical real estate simply because the yield was high enough to, for for people who uh, bought those securities for their yield. 
Um, indeed, the, there is a ph phenomenon so much cherished by uh, value investors, which is a phenomenon of the double discount. In other words, there, there, there were every now and then opportunities to buy stocks of real estate operating companies at a discount to the then depressed physical real estate. So you were buying at a discount something that was already selling at a discount. Hence the double discount. The, uh, apropos Warren Buffett, I think there is a, a, a key question. If you look at, at, at the way Buffett operates, he practically never sells. Indeed, he was asked once, when do you sell? He said practically ne almost never. Uh, there are exceptions. He sold a few, but uh, almost never. And, um, and there are value investors who take the attitude, uh, and, and frankly to the question, should a st stock be sold once it reaches, even if it's a Buffett type stock, once it reaches its then intrinsic value? And, and my answer, which is not particularly helpful, is it depends. It depends upon the confidence one has that one is, owns a, uh, the stock of a business that's compounding, you know, value. In which case, I think one, uh, one should be willing to accept the fact that the stock can become modestly or, or moderately overvalued and not, you know, not start selling it. Uh, Buffett acknowledged uh, several years ago that he made a mistake uh, in 97 or 98 when the Coca-Cola stock sold at, at a multiple that was extraordinarily expensive became vastly overvalued. Uh, he said I should have started s selling some. So there is no doubt that vastly overvalued, but if it's modestly or moderately overvalued, I think it's a function of the amount of confidence, which rightly or wrongly so, one has, or the investor has, in the fact that he's, it is totally a business that's compounding value. The, um, um, I, think, I think some people in, the, in Buffett's camp in the late 90s Look at the amount of, looked at the amount of water that we was, was being consumed throughout the world and said, gee, I mean, there is still plenty of room for Coke. Which, of course, was um, taking things, things a little too far. Um, the, uh, indeed, I would argue today that, you know, Coca-Cola, even though, you know, the, the, there is more to the company than soda pop, that soda pop, uh, it's not just that uh, people say, hey, you know, uh, it's not good for your teeth and it's not good for children that will become obese and etc. It's also a matter that I think the taste of the younger people is moving away from the sugary, the, the sugary stuff. So maybe the future of Coke is not as um, appealing as, uh, as it used to be. I think the, the attitude of the people who truly believe in Coca-Cola is to say, hey, it's been around 120 years or so, uh, something that has been around 120 years may be around forever. Maybe, maybe not. Um, the, um, uh, Buffett also said, you know, investing is simple, but it's not easy. Uh, the, um, uh, and particularly by comparison with consultants and sometimes Wall Street, which, which likes to complicate things. The, uh, I'm on the board of a nonprofit in Manhattan, which uh, will remain unnamed. Um, where we get the advice of a well-known consultant and they produce, you know, every quarter a thick book and I read 15 pages of the, of the book and I get a headache. Uh, you know, consultants on Wall Street uh, uh, tend to complete both crime. You look at both crime in the intelligent investor and Buffett in the letters to shareholders in the annual report of Berkshire Hathaway and uh, what I love best is the simplicity of the uh, of their arguments. The uh, indeed, apropos Wall Street, when I, I I won't tell you what I say on Wall Street when I'm not in a good mood, but when I'm a good, in a good mood, I say Wall Street is nothing but a vast promotion machine. The um, uh, but uh, you know, and apropos the you know, the. Uh, uh, as I said before, the, uh, the Buffett approach 
is more time consuming than the, but potentially much more rewarding than the GRAM approach. And uh, when I started running the, what was then called the Surgeon International Fund in 1979, it was a $15 million, do, dollar, uh, uh, $15 million in size. Today we run $85 billion. Uh, I mean, I, I have to share the credit for the $85 billion to uh, with you know, quite a few other people. Would it be only the in-house analysts and also the people who are involved in sales and uh, administration? The, um, but the, um, uh, but you know, as luck would, would, have, uh, would have it, and there is not a that not in life, including professional life, luck does matter. You know, there is a story about Napoleon. He uh, was surrounded by a few aides and. Uh, when one of the aides mentioned the name of a general and, and, and proceeded to say that the general was lazy, corrupt, uh, etc., et, et and Napoleon said, oh, but he, he did very well in the last battle. And the aide said, oh, yeah, but he was lucky. And Napoleon said, I want lucky people around me, um, at least lucky generals around me. Uh, so as luck would have it, in the early 80s, early to mid 80s, there were plenty of not just in the U.S., but pretty much throughout the world, there were plenty of uh, Benjamin Graham-type stocks around because the, the, the 1970s had been a very difficult decade for equities. Today, except in Japan, and in Japan for the obvious reason that since there are no hostile takeovers, management, managements are never worried about a, you know, a, 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 an attempt to, to, to take the company over even from, not just from foreigners, and even from uh, Jap another Japanese company. Uh, um, and, but otherwise, in, in Europe and in the U.S., uh, uh, there are very few, uh, except among the micro caps and the small caps, there are very few ben -Gram type, uh, Benjamin Graham type stocks. Indeed, apropos the Japanese stocks, sometimes people say, oh, gee, I mean, I own the, a stock in Japan where the net cash, uh, cash net of all cash, plus sometimes peripheral assets, sometimes real estate, uh, sometimes stakes in other companies, uh, net cash net of all financial liabilities is in excess of market cap. And sometimes people who, who own that kind of stock, they say it's a layup. Well, there ain't no such thing as a layup in investing, or very, uh, very seldom, because if the company was so far, um, so far was making a possibly modest profit every year, as soon as you buy the stock, starts running a, a string of losses over the next five years. After five years, because of the losses, the cash is gone, and you've made a mistake. So, uh, um, so there is no, uh, as Molly Whitman likes to say, there is always something that can go wrong. The, um, uh, and also there is a matter that uh, it's not just that uh, value investing works, uh, makes sense in the U.S., it, it makes sense globally as well. I mean, indeed, in the um, 80s and 90s in continental Europe, uh, there were plenty of, uh, of small stocks that were completely ignored by major investors, because major investors in Europe, uh, and I think they continue to do the same thing today, uh, you know, basically they traded in and out of the big stocks in the, in the index. And, and there were also, um, particularly with uh, stocks of companies that were controlled by a family, instances of extraordinary conservative accounting. In Germany, in Switzerland, sometimes in France. Uh, a friend of mine says that the, uh, that the accounting in a particular country reflects the mind, mindset within the country. And that the Germans are, I, I hate to generalize, uh, and I shouldn't probably, but the Germans tend to be characterized by, by anxiety, what the Germans call angst. And that their accounting, the accounting in their businesses, at least in the 80s and 90s, reflected that anxiety and they tended to provide for risks, non-existent risks, just in case, just in case of World War III or something like that. 
So there were, uh, you know, globally there were tremendous opportunities, and and, uh, and and George and I were talking about it uh, a few minutes ago. In Hong Kong, I was told in the early 80s when I started, you know, buying stocks in Hong Kong, I was told this market is not for you, this market is not for value investors, it's in the hands of traders, uh, what the British call punters, and you should ignore that market. And we've done, you know, reasonably well in Hong Kong over the years, Admittedly, the market in Hong Kong can be, because of the existence of, of those traders, sometimes day traders, extremely volatile, but volatility is not risk. As um, Marty Whitman points out in one of his books, there, he makes a key distinction between what he calls temporary unrealized capital loss and permanent impairment of capital. Temporary unrealized capital loss is you buy, you identify the intrinsic value of a business at $50 per share. You buy the stock at 30. Uh, no, I'm sorry, at 70, an uh, intrinsic value at 70. You buy the stock at, at uh, 30, at, at 50. After a year or two, it goes down to 30. You have to, uh, uh, you have to, to think very seriously about the, the mistakes you, you might have made, but if you come to, after doing much additional work, if you come to the conclusion that uh, the intrinsic value is still, I mean, it's never, you know, a fixed number, is in the area of 70, and the stock has gone from 50 to 30, uh, that's temporary unrealized capital loss. But sometimes, either because the business model of a particular industry has changed, for instance, the newspaper business used to be a terrific business. Today, it's a terrible business because of the Internet. I mean, the advertising has moved to, to, to a particularly classified adver advertising, which was very profitable for the newspapers, has moved, and has moved to the Internet. Or management makes mistake, make mistakes. It's not the business model that deteriorates. It's, it's management that makes mistakes. Particularly management has been successful for a while, Sometimes it gets to their head and they start making mistakes. They overpay, make a, overpay for an acquisition or things like that. Um, so uh, you have to think seriously. If you buy a stock at uh, 50, thinking that the intrinsic value is 70 and the stock goes to 30, but again, you have to make the. Uh, uh, it's not enough of a reason to sell. It's enough of a reason to look, you know, very closely again at the business and make sure that you understand it. Um, um, but if you do, then what, uh, you should look at it as a temporary, you know, unrealized uh, capital loss. And things like that happen. The, um, and sometimes there are, there are differences in accounting that are extraordinary. I mean, we, uh, in the U.S. hasn't happened yet, and I wonder why, but most of the European airports have been privatized, and in Asia as well, many airports have been privatized. Uh, and, uh, and we got interested when they began to be privatized in the late 80s, early 90s, and we could see differences in accounting that were considerable. I don't remember whether it was a Copenhagen airport or, or Vienna airport, they depreciated their runway over 20 or 25 years. British airports depreciated its runways, and the runways are runway, over 100 years. The British have always, uh, and I think it was not a matter that, uh, that um, uh, the, uh, the British were right or the Austrians were right. The, the truth was probably in between. But the, what it showed was that the British tend to have accounting that, that is uh, not necessarily misleading, but liberal, should I say liberal, while the in continental Europe, the accounting tends to be more, much more, you know, conservative. And I think it has a lot to do, or it had a lot to do, it's less true today than it was before anyway, but it, it has a lot to do with the fact that in, in England, there is a genuine interest by a good chunk of the population in investing in stocks. Uh, in continental Europe, in Germany, for instance, I think now, now it's not the same, but 20 or 30 years ago, most German individuals bought bonds. They didn't buy stocks. It was too uh, speculative to, to their taste. The, uh, it works over time. The, um, 
1984, uh, the uh, Warren Buffett published in the Columbia Business School magazine, Hermes, um, a, uh, what was called the Super Investors of Graham and Dartsville, an article in, in which in an attempt to show that, uh, which was very kind of him, an attempt to show that his own success of, as an investor, which was already obvious to the mid-80s, would do was due not just to his own extraordinary skills, but also due to how sound his, his investment approach was. So he um, he took uh, he took his own record over time. Over time, are the two important uh, words, and the records of another nine invest, value investors. Some of them were close to him. Some of them were closer to Ben Graham, such as Walter Schloss. And he, he showed that it was not four or seven or nine out of ten, it was ten out of ten who over a period of time long enough to be significant, significant had done much better than average. And in, in an attempt to update the, the Buffett piece of 20 years before, in 2004, the late Lou Lowenstein, who is the, was, because he passed away several years ago, the father of Roger Lowenstein, who wrote the definitive book about long-term capital management, the uh, hedge fund that uh, that collapsed in the late 90s and collapsed to the point where uh, the Federal Reserve of New York had to organize. They didn't, it was not taxpayers' money that went in there, but the Federal Reserve of New York put pressure on a number of banks and organized a, uh, a uh, bailout of long-term capital management. And at the time, I remember, I had started a, head, a gold fund in 1993, five years before, and I was ready to send a letter to investors saying, look, uh, because I had nothing to show but losses then, uh, because the price of gold had continued to go down. Look, I made a mistake. Uh, I apologize for it. Let's move on, and uh, why don't we liquidate the gold fund? And then, the Federal Reserve of New York organized the, the bailout of long-term capital management. I, so, I said to myself, you know, it's one thing to bail out a bank. I mean, after all, the bank, it's, it's, it's the money of depositors. Uh, it's serious money. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, it's good to, uh, to dissipate the, the money of wealthy people. No. But it's wealthy people who own, who had a stake in, uh, uh, in long-term capital management. So if, if anything should, should fail and should never be bailed out, it's a hedge fund, for heaven's sake. Uh, and I, th I, th I said to myself, gee, I mean, the, 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 the financial system would be, must be really fragile, which it proved to be, uh, you know, 10 years later. The uh, financial system must be really fragile for the Federal Reserve of New York to organize a bailout of a, of a hedge fund. The... Um, so uh, Lou Lowenstein uh, took 10 value funds, and in the interest of full dis disclosure, he included our first Eagle Global Fund. And, um, and again, uh, he showed that it's 10 out of 10 that had done much better than average over time. The Lowenstein piece is in his book, The Investor's Dilemma, which is extremely critical of the mutual fund industry. Uh, we were talking, uh, George and I, we were talking about it, uh, you know, at, at dinner. The mutual fund, because there are many mutual, indeed there is an article today in the Financial Times about the fact that uh, uh, most American mutual funds tend to be closet indexers. They don't, uh, they're so afraid to, uh, not to keep up with their peers and with the benchmark in the short term that uh, they are, they're almost like an index fund which, of course, raises the question, if they're almost like an index fund, why are they, charges, why, why are they charging so, 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 such extraordinarily high fees? The, um, and, and, and Lou Lowenstein was right. I mean, most mutual fund groups are run by marketing types who, who look at their funds at, as asset-gathering machines. I must say that uh, Lou Lowenstein has a few kind words about us, about First Eagle Funds, in his, in his book. Uh, so, you know, no wonder I, mentioned, I, I quote him. 
the, uh, if, now, if it makes sense and if it works over time, why are there so few value investors? The late Bill Rowan, who used to run very successfully the uh, Sequoia Fund, so successfully that the Sequoia Fund was closed most of the time to new investors. Uh, the late Bill Rowan estimated, and I think it's still true today, that only 5% or so of professionally managed money was run on a value investing basis, very broadly speaking, from Ben Graham to Buffett. Um, so why so few? I think the main, there are other reasons, but the main reason is psychological. If you're a value investor or a long-term investor, it goes back to what Ben Graham says in his book, that short-term the stock market is a voting machine, and uh, traders, speculators, uh, uh, um, um, buy and sell securities on a short-term basis. While long-term, it's a weighing machine which weighs the realities of a business. And of course, the value investor is on the side of the weighing machine and doesn't want, is not interested in being on the side of the voting machine. The, um, so if you're a value investor or a long-term investor, if, if you're a long-term investor, you accept in advance that since you are not trying to keep up with your peers and with the benchmark on a short-term basis, every now and then you will lag. And to lag is to suffer. And that's what Jeremy Grantham calls career risk. Uh, if you lag, we lag every now and then a little in the 80s and the early 90s, mid-90s. In the late 90s, I lag badly for three years in a row. 97, 98, 99. After 1997, our investors were displeased. After 1998, they were furious. After 1999, they were gone. In a fund I had run since 1979, so it had a long-term record. We lost seven out of 10 shareholders between the fall of 97 and the spring of 2000. Um, so, um, so, uh, the main reason is psychological, and you know I don't know why the uh, the French bank decide, did not decide to fire me. <laughs> uh, maybe they thought so, so. They didn't decide to fire me. They they decided to sell the operation. That's why at the turn of the century we moved from working for Société Générale, the French bank, to moving to working for Anhol and Esprit Froder, the medium-sized securities firm. The, um, so, I mean, and there's nothing to be ashamed of to, I mean, if a man is in his mid-30s, has two or three kids, he doesn't want the risk of being fired. And if he lags for a year or two, number one, maybe his bonus will, will be cut. But number two, in, in an extreme case, uh, if he loses enough investors, and again, I lost seven out of ten, which is plenty, uh, in three years, uh, if he loses enough investors, maybe the, the boss will, will fire him. So, um, I mean, it's not just the, it's not just the, um, the career risk. It's, uh, it's the fact that human nature shrinks from pain. And the, um, uh, and it's hard to move away from the herd even if you feel that the herd eventually will run, will run over the cliff, because the truth is it's warmer inside the herd. The, um, you know, Buffett says, in order to be a success, reasonably successful investor over the long term, over time, does not take a high IQ, but he said it takes temperament, by, by which I, I, I mean he believes the willingness to swim upstream the willingness to go against the grain, uh, not systematically because then you're just a contrarian, but whenever you feel it is appropriate. Um, now, some, sometimes we, people say, well, how come I'm, I'm willing, I was willing to take the pain, uh, you know, in 97, 98, 99. I'm not sure why, I'm not sure why but uh, except that uh, uh, I was a genuine value investor and I could, couldn't quite see myself being transformed into something else. The, um, uh, incidentally, our in-house analysts, I think, have an advantage over in-house analysts in shops that are not value shops, because in a shop that is not a value shop, 
The, the odds are that the portfolio manager will listen more carefully to the sell-side analyst at Morgan Stanley or Goldman, or Goldman Sachs rather than listen to his own in-house, his or her own in-house analyst. Well, with us, there is no risk about that because your sell-side research, with exception, the stuff that comes out of Wall Street or the equivalent of Wall Street outside the U.S., uh, with exceptions, every rule has its exceptions, with exceptions, the, and because 95% of, invest, of investors are basically short-term traders uh, or are very eager to keep up with the benchmark and with their peers, th so the time horizon of sell-side research, usually 6 to 12 months, is the idea. If I buy a stock in March, I want to be able to sell it before December at a profit, hopefully, before December. Uh, while the, uh, the value investor is a long-term investor, and uh, I, I, I think we're, we, we, we hold, we, historically we, we've held securities on average for five years. Sometimes it's a year or two, either because we realize we made a mistake, the uh, permanent impairment of capital, or stock moves up a ton over a period of only a year or two, but sometimes we hold a security for seven or eight years. Indeed, there is one stock which we own between 1979 and I think uh, 2007 or so. Um, the, um, not the same number of, uh, of, of securities at, uh, at the same time, but uh, uh, over time, but, uh, but we owned it for uh, uh, yeah, a very long period of time. The, um, So a secondary reason why there are so few value investors is that it takes hard work. Since sell-side research is of very little use, we have to do most of the work, almost all of the work, ourselves. The, um, the, the moral of the story is this. In Omaha, uh, 40 years ago, 40, 45 years ago, there were a number of people who happened to be neighbors or friends of Warren Buffett, maybe their kids went to the same school as the Buffett kids, and they could see that, number one, Warren Buffett seemed to know what he was talking about, and number two, and most importantly, that he seemed to have integrity. And so some of them had, were people of relatively modest means, but they invested their savings with Buffett. And some of them, you know, except for every now and then having to sell some Berkshire Hathaway uh, uh, in order to buy a car or a house or whatever, or finance the, the education of their children. Uh, some of them held on to most of the Berkshire Hathaway stocks over, over, over the decades. And, you know, as, 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 um, um, as Albert Einstein once said, Compounding is one of the great marvels of the world. In the case of Buffett, the money was compounding at 20% a year over more than 40 years. You compute it with your machine and you, you see what kind of results you get. The, um, I mean, I know one of those in, in, investors who was in Omaha at that time. It's an old lady now. She's an old lady now, and uh, among other things, in her apartment in Manhattan, she has a terrific Edward Hopper painting. The, um, now, what, what happened in 2008? I, I think in 2008, uh, you know, some value investors were down 35, 40, 45 percent. I was not very happy with myself, but we were down. Our global fund, our overseas fund, were down only 21 percent, which was much too much for me in any case. Uh, so what happened? Now, some value investors who were down 40% say, uh, hey, it, it was only one year, which is fair enough, except that to recover from a decline of 40% in one year is not uh, the easiest thing in the world. Um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, um, I, um, I think, I think um, we, uh, I mean, I, I, I could see in the early 80s that a credit boom was beginning, uh, in early to mid-80s, mid-80s because the leverage buyout phenomenon began in the mid-80s. 
And uh, it was interrupted, the credit boom was interrupted briefly in 19, around 1990, and that's 1990, 91, that's when both News Corp, the, uh, the big, uh, you know, conglomerate, and uh, Sam Zell in real estate almost went bankrupt. Uh, News Corp, because Rupert Murdoch had made a, overpaid for acquisitions, particularly TV Guide, which proved to be a business that would shortly uh, decline. And he had too much debt. And uh, I remember at the time, we would have done much better if we had bought the stock uh, because, because, you know, the ideally you want, to, so we own the bonds. Ideally you want to own a bond when uh, the cash flow is here to service the debt. But sometimes the cash flow temporarily, and that was the case we thought of News Corp, Temporarily was not there to service the debt, but that the assets were valuable enough, even if conservatively est estimated, so that um, uh, so that there was genuine equity, you know, uh, on the balance sheet. So um, the um, But, 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 and then I, I could see that the credit boom resumed in the 90s and accelerated, particularly in residential real estate at the beginning of, of, the, of this century. Indeed, one could argue that in 2007, when uh, the roof fell in, uh, it was a matter of the last individual with no job, no assets, no income, getting a mortgage with no money down. Once that happened, it was, it was all over. The, uh, and, and I was somewhat familiar with the so-called, uh, you know, Austrian uh, economics. The people who, who in the 1920s, there is, I don't have the time to, to talk about anecdotes, but there is a lovely anecdote about Ludwig von Mises, uh, and, and the two major personalities were Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises. And in the, in the 20s, they said, hey, uh, you have to be very careful not to let a credit boom go on. And, and in the 1920s, it was not just the stock market in the U.S. or elsewhere that was going through the roof. It was also the period of the Florida land boom. Real estate also was going through the roof. Uh, uh, you have to be careful not to let the credit boom go on too long and be too strong because a credit bust will follow the credit boom just like night follows day. And I think the models of uh, today, the models of many economists don't, or at least didn't take that into account, which is why so few people saw the uh, major crisis coming. Um, uh, and I think the, the key question today is, uh, at a time when uh, I think we were in the beginnings of a bubble, uh, not just in the U.S., but elsewhere as well. And, uh, and the key question today, and where investors seem to believe that, uh, hey, you know, quantitative easing, uh, it's equities by default. Nobody wants to buy bonds because the interest rates are too low. Nobody wants to hold cash because interest rates are zero on cash, practically zero. Uh, so, you know, what is there, what is there other than, than equities? The truth is, quantitative easing cannot go on forever. Indeed, they seem to, uh, they seem to be giving the impression that they want to, to, over time to, to, to stop it. Um, although I think they want to be very careful about that. I think the key question today is, are we still in the post-World War II economic and financial landscape, or are we in a new, so far undefined, possibly threatening landscape. And I don't pretend to have the answer, but I think it's a possibility and I want, you know, protection uh, and I want some protection against that. Uh, but I, I've talked already too long. I, uh, I, I, I thought I would, I would say just a few words about, uh, you know, th three investments we made over the decades. Uh, one, which is a, uh, an investment in, in the Benjamin Crab type, type stock, one in a Warren Buffett type stock, and the third, which was a big, big, big mistake of mine. Uh, it, it so happens that uh, the three uh, are Swiss stocks. It just happened that way, and it goes to show that uh, 
Uh, it's truly a global world because there are so many companies, particularly in Switzerland, which is a small country, which are truly global, uh, global in, in, in scope. Um, the, um, and so, you know, when people say, well, I bought Nestle, so I bought a Swiss stock, it has nothing to do, very little to do with Switzerland because Nestle, I think, does about 10% of their, of their overall business in, in Switzerland. The, um, the Van Graam type stock is the Bank for International Settlements, which is somewhat quirky, but uh, I'm a quirky, uh, or I used to be a quirky uh, value investor, particularly when the, the funds were smaller, because the quirky stocks are to be found mostly in smaller stocks. Um, uh, you, the Bank for International Settlements was, was a multinational, uh, is a multinational organization which was created in the 20s to handle German reparations, war reparations. But bureaucracies never die, and after the reparations were handled, the, 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 the Bank for International Settlements continued to exist. The, the U.S. Senate, which was um, uh, at the time when the BIS was created, the U.S. Senate, where there were plenty of isolationists, uh, uh, declined to subscribe to the initial capital of, uh, of BIS, and the American tranche was sold to the public, mostly in Europe. And the stock was listed um, uh, over the counter in Basel in the 30s and continuing. Uh, in, uh, we started buying the stock in 1982, uh, uh, and, and we eventually became the largest non-central bank owner of, of the stock. Uh, to us, it was a combination. Whenever I mentioned that to somebody at the BIS, they recoiled recoil in horror. Uh, to my mind, it was a combination, a money market fund and gold bullion. Gold bullion because it was initially capitalized with gold, like many banks used to be, and it continued to hold on to the gold. Uh, bullion uh, as part as most of their capital and money market fund because 90% of the assets and liabilities matured within, within one year. It's essentially um, uh, the BS borrowed from central banks at a market rate and lent to JP Morgan or major banks like that with a very thin spread. The um, uh, the um, uh, um, the stock often uh, uh, was of no interest to, to anybody except us, apparently, and uh, it, it often sold at a discount of 40, 50, or even 60 percent to the um, to the net asset value, which of course took into account the then the then price of gold, the um, the adjusted book value at the at the turn of the century the. Management of BIS decided to take out the private shareholders either because they got tired of our questions or because they saw that the International Monetary Fund had been somewhat discredited at the time of the Asian crisis in the late 90s and, uh, and the World Bank had been somewhat discredited for a while because too much money uh, coming from the World Bank, i.e. from taxpayers throughout the world, ending up in the pockets of dictators in Africa or in Asia or elsewhere, or in South America, ending up in the wrong pockets. The, um, um, so they decided to, to, um, to take us out, and they offered a price which was double the stock price at the time, and yet we were not, we were not satisfied at all. Indeed, one of the best compliments we ever received was uh, quite a while ago when Warren Buffett acquired a company that made bricks and Tony Lama boots. Uh, uh, and we were shareholders in the stock, and the price he paid was very close to the price we thought was the intrinsic value of the business. Buffett, if he likes a business, which he did, obviously, in that case, is willing to pay a reasonable price. And, and we thought it's a reasonable price, we, and I, we drank champagne that, that day at the office. The, um, so they offered, uh, so, so people, people said, hey, they're offering twice the stock price. But still, with the added disclosure they had to provide at the time when they uh, tried, were trying to take us out, we decided that the, the genuine price 
genuine value of the stock on a static basis was four times the, the stock price. So twice the price that, that was being offered by them. Because they had do, done, they had hired Arthur Anderson, and incidentally Arthur Anderson one year later collapsed uh, in, in a scandal. Uh, and, and the other uh, institution they had hired was J.P. Morgan Paris, which when I was living and working in Paris, was usually the refuge of, of sons, daughters, nieces, nephews of, of wealthy people. Uh, wealthy or influential people, or both. The, um, um, so, uh, so we sued in The Hague. Now, the tribunal in The Hague uh, was made up of judges, and there was no appeal. Made up of judges uh, who were law professors picked by the governor of the central bank of a particular country. In other words, the the, uh, I should have sent him a, uh, a little note uh, afterwards, but the, the law professor uh, in France was at the University of Rouen, and, uh, and he was uh, the governor of the Bank of France, picked him to be the French judge, and people came to me and said, you're not going to win, you're going to lose, because how likely is it that the law professor who was picked by the governor of, the, of his country's central bank, and the governor is on the board of the BIS, how likely is it that that law professor will find against the BIS? Well, there is such a thing as the intellectual honesty of academics. After all, academics are seekers of the truth. Because we prevailed, not completely. Uh, it was a judgment of Solomon, in a sense, because... Uh, we got three times the, in other words, we got 50% more than what the BIS was, was offering. And one of my colleagues was there when the judgment was rendered, and he could see the face of the representative of the BIS and the face of the American lawyer. Their jaws were falling off. The, um, uh, incidentally, I'm extremely grateful. It happened in 2001 or so. And it was good that uh, I was no longer with, you know, with the French bank because I think the French bank would have, would have refused to let me sue the Bank for International Settlements where the governor of the Bank of France was a board member. Uh, but at Arnaud and Esbachwader, to their immense credit, they, uh, they agreed to, to uh, as long as we were not suing Greenspan personally, <laughs> because Greenspan, of course, was on the board of the BAS too, uh, they were willing to let us um, away. Um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the Buffett piece, well, what turned out to be a Buffett stock was, well, I'll continue with my mistake. My mistake was Swiss Air, where we started buying it in the early 90s. Uh, the, uh, because they had a very modern fleet, of airplanes, you know, less than five years old on average. They also had major peripheral assets, hotels, uh, other peripheral assets as, as well. Uh, and the stock had declined because of the recession around 1990, because Gulf, the Gulf War had hit tourism, and because the oil price had gone up. Uh, but the balance sheet at the time was strong. Indeed, the Nickname of Swiss Air was the Flying Swiss Bank. Um, uh, but, uh, but then they expanded in the 90s. Uh, the debt ballooned. On top of that, there was some of the debt that was included in the unconsolidated uh, in, uh, subsidiaries, so debt that did not appear in consolidated accounts which is the same thing that had happened with some of the Shebol in South Korea in the late, uh, in the late 90s. But, and I should have uh, more than noticed that the debt was going up and that the expansion was, uh, uh, incidentally, the expansion the, uh, had to do with the fact they were advised by McKinsey, the, consult, the famous consulting firm. Uh, but, you know, when, when debt goes up, it's a signal uh, because if the debt-to-equity ratio goes from 10 to 1, 
then a 10% decline in the value of the asset wipes out the equity. Indeed, Lehman Brothers, when they, uh, when they collapsed, the, the leverage was 30 to 1. Equity was 3% of the total balance sheet. doesn't take too much of a decline in the asset values for the equity to disappear. And, you know, basically, the, uh, I sold it before the company, uh, Swiss Air, went into bankruptcy. But we lost, it was not one of the major holdings, but uh, I think we lost, uh, when, when, when we sold, uh, uh, we had to take a loss of about 50% or more. The, uh, uh, that's a lesson on, on leverage, that leverage works both ways. Uh, it magnifies your gains when everything goes well, magnifies your losses when things don't go well. And on top of that, value investors should never use borrowing because the second problem with borrowing is that it reduces or eliminates your staying power. Uh, at at long-term capital management, if they could have, uh, you know, waited six months or so, they would have been fine. They could barely wait three or four days before getting the margin calls. The uh, the stock that turned into a Buffett-type stock was Linton Sprungley. I think my successor has sold, uh, because the stock is today is extremely expensive, I sold quite a bit, and I'm not blaming him strongly, uh, I sold quite a bit of, of the holding, but we bought it, I started buying it in the mid-80s because people, somebody had passed on to me the annual report of Linton Fongley. And I flipped through it and I saw that uh, the stock was selling very cheaply, eight or ten times earnings, but incidentally, price earnings ratio is not our favorite um, uh, yardstick. Our favorite yardstick, even though it's not perfect, it's enterprise value to EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, enterprise value being market cap plus net debt or minus net cash because it introduces the balance, it introduces the balance sheet in the, in the picture. So uh, Lint was selling at eight or ten times uh, earnings, um, but I could see with the annual report that the, the profits, that the company was not as profitable as probably it should be, uh, that earnings had been sort of flattish over the previous five or ten years, and then I looked further, and I could see that uh, Rudy Sprungli, who was a member of the Sprungli family, uh, who was the chief executive officer, uh, changed presidents and chief operating officers once every two years or so. And that, uh, you know, in, in general, uh, you know, the business was poorly run. That the uh, that that in particular the the plants were not as efficient as they, uh, as they should be. I, I knew somebody who had visited a plant and who told me, uh, you know, that should be improved considerably. Uh, because the stock was so cheap, uh, because I liked the product personally, <laughs> I must say maybe, um, uh, I, I started buying the stock. And then, uh, before we were finished with buying, Rudy Sprungli, uh, made a big mistake. Already the family was unhappy with him because the stock had been flat for quite a while, and he made, made a big mistake. Uh, he, uh, he married an American woman who was the member of a cult. And to the good Swiss society, that was a no-no. So they got rid of Rudy. Already, as I said, they were unhappy with him, but they got rid of Rudy. Uh, and they either they themselves or they were well advised because the next chief executive officer was the man who was running, who was originally from Switzerland or Germany, I'm not sure, but who was running the Johnson & Johnson operations in Europe. And he's done a terrific job over the past, uh, over the past uh, 25 years almost. Uh, terrific job to the, to the point where uh, he's penetrated the American market very successfully, initially by opening uh, stores here and there. There is one on Fifth Avenue uh, in Manhattan. Uh, but, but now he's closing them down, not because they are losing money, although they never made much money, but he was trying to convince Americans because so far the t taste of Americans for chocolate uh, was very different from the taste of Europeans for chocolate. I love the Linton Frogley 
coming from Europe. I love the Lindt, and, uh, the Lindt chocolates. I hate the American chocolates. Uh, and uh, indeed, Warren Buffett owns <laughs> a chocolate business in uh, California, the name of which, which escapes me right now. Maybe George. Uh, yeah. Yes, the uh, name will come back to me later. Uh, and my, my late father-in-law used to send me, uh, uh, you know, chocolates by, by, the, by the Buffett uh, company uh, every year for my birthday, and uh, I had to give it away because I, I just didn't like the, the, the chocolate. Anyway, he, he changed the, the taste of American consumers in terms of chocolate. He's doing very well in the U.S. He's, he's doing very well uh, practically everywhere now. But as I said, the stock has become extraordinarily, uh, you know, expensive. Uh, Nestle probably made a, if, if you look at the success of Lint compared, because it's a major division of Nestle, the success of what they call the confectionery business, there is absolutely no doubt that over, over the past 20 years, Lint has, has done much better than Nestle. And when Rudy Sprungli was kicked out, Nestle probably missed the opportunity uh, of, of acquire, to acquire your to acquire your land. Um, you know, uh, so um, I, I think al also um, George had a few, you know, a few questions for me. What principles do we apply in searching out investment opportunities for detailed study? Um, when our younger daughter was six or seven years old, somebody at school asked her, what does your father do? And she was embarrassed because she didn't know. And that evening she said, hey, what do you do for a living? And I was not about to explain my management to a six-year-old, so I said, Pauline, I'll tell you how I spend my day. I spent half of my day reading, and to some extent I did that because I had heard before that uh, Warren Buffett himself was a voracious reader. And I said to myself, I'm not as smart as he is, but if it helps him, if being a voracious reader helps him, maybe it will help me too, which it did, I think. So I spent about half of my day uh, reading and the other half talking with my in-house analysts, you know, back and forth. And Pauline said, talking, reading, that's not work. Well, <laughs> that's how it is. Um, so um, uh, I read a lot. Uh, And, and also the in-house analysts, they, they have three roles. Number one, they cover a number of stocks that we own. Number two, they investigate, or they investigated when I was in charge, the ideas that the boss had. And they knew that if they came to me after investigating the idea, because it was an idea which was probably the result of my reading an, an article in a newspaper or a magazine, if they came back to me and said, hey, boss, uh, uh, forget it, uh, there, are, there are all sorts of negatives. They knew that I would, uh, I would not insist. And finally, I gave them enough time to come up with their own investment ideas, and they had to come to me to, but nine times out of ten, I, I said fine, uh, because I wanted to encourage them to, uh, you know, come up with their own ideas and then develop the ideas themselves. So sometimes the ideas, uh, you know, came to me and were investigated by the in-house analysts. Sometimes the ideas uh, came from the in-house analysts. Uh, what kind of information and securities are they seeking? As I said before, we're seeking public information to begin with, and if we're satisfied with it, then we go come into the qualitative. We try to find what the which is the most difficult thing to do, the, the major strengths and weaknesses of, 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 a, of a business. Um, what kind of irrationalities do we consider? Uh, investor in irrationalities, well, it's greed and fear. Uh, you know, people are not, uh, I mean, there, there is a history. When I, when I think that seven out of 10 shareholders abandoned me uh, in the late 90s, in less than three years, it was just uh, after three years where I had lagged badly, admittedly, but then 2000, 2001, 2002, we were up 10% each and every one of those years, and I think 2003, we were up 35 or 
So they sold uh, just before we started doing terrific. My attitude is to, it's their problem because we were always extremely straightforward in explaining what we were trying to do, including the fact that every now and then we, we would lag. And, you know, most investors, they say, yes, yes. And then one uh, intermediary told me, uh, one financial plan, planner told me that it was, uh, that it was a mother-in-law problem because he, he said one of his clients went to dinner at his mother-in-law uh, already he, the client didn't get along with his mother-in-law, that happens. And the mother-in-law said, Robert, my, my fund is up 45% this year. How about yours? And if he was with us in 97, 98, or 99, we were up nowhere near 45%. So uh, the day after, or morning after, Robert comes in, he's, he's foaming at the mouth, and he comes into the office of the financial planner and says, throw the bums out. The bums being us. Uh, so, um, w what periods lead us to greater or lesser investment? You know, value investors they tend to buy on the way down, uh, not on the, not on, if possible, not on the way up. I mean, admittedly, uh, we were talking about it at dinner. In, in more than, I, I, I've been in the investment business one way or the other for more than half a century. And uh, there is only one major market where I thought I could look at 45 stocks and I, I would not end up buying one of them. It was the Tokyo stock market in the late 80s, in 1988, 89. Incidentally, I think a, a, a good chunk of the record over time of our funds has a lot to do not with what we owned, but what we decided not to own. Not to own the Japanese stocks in 88, 89, particularly in 89, not to own the technology, media, and telecom stocks in the late 90s, and not to own the financial stocks at, at, the, uh, at the beginning of, the, of this uh, century. The, um, but I've talked already uh, too long. Well, if there is some time for a few, uh, some time for a few questions. Hi. Hi. First of all, thank you very much. No, pleasure. Uh, a lot of value investors tend to shy away from technology stocks for various reasons. Right. N not all of them. I mean, even Buffett, he bought a big chunk of IBM, which may, may not serve him well. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, because it's a fast-changing field. You look at Buffett, and where did he make his money? Uh, newspaper stocks for a while, media stocks in general, advertising stocks, Coca-Cola, relatively simple businesses. Uh, you know, sometimes with some of the smartest in-house analysts I had during my 25 or 30 years, some of them loved the idea of working on a complicated situation. And I had to explain to them, number one, that there is nothing, to, there is nothing wrong with making money with a simple investment idea. And number two, uh, that the more complicated it is, the greater the odds that we will miss something. So because technology is a fast-changing field that is very difficult to sustain, is, uh, to have a sustainable competitive advantage, we tend to shy away from technology. That's right. That's true. I was also wondering, um, what industries do you see going forward as, as opportunities and perhaps that fit with your style? And specifically, you mentioned uh, metrics like uh, EV to EBIT. Um, is there like a cutoff that you have in that particular industry, or are you sort of does it depend? Uh, you know, I think we never buy uh, we never buy anything. At, we never bought anything, and I think my successor agrees with that as well. We never bought anything at more than uh, at fifteen times enterprise value to EBIT. Uh, we we tend to to believe that. Uh, we might be interested in a business which is not a great or even a very good business at eight times and about to EBIT. We'd be willing to pay 10 to 12 times for a business that's really attractive. Uh, we will not pay 15 times, but sometimes, as with Lint and Spongley, we will hold on to the stock even if it reaches 15 times and about to EBIT, right? But again, 
The great, because if you think of price earnings ratio, if you think of a company with no debt and a price earnings ratio of 15, and a company with a lot of debt, a price earnings ratio of 15, those are two very different animals. Right. Is my question revolves around emerging markets. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts were on using value investing as an approach uh, for emerging markets. Uh, yes, we, ha we have owned stocks uh, in emerging markets. Um, uh, although, for instance, uh, uh, over the past, I think we we owned the Russian stock in the in, in the in the 90s, but uh, or Russian fund in the 90s, but um, but Russia over the past few years we didn't want to touch it because it seemed to us that uh, you know Putin uh, you think and it doesn't matter whether you're domestic or foreign, whether you're a Russian or whether you're a foreigner, but Putin um, you own a business. Uh, until Putin dis decides that you don't own it. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> so, you know, in cases like that, we'll be very hesitant to, uh, right. But although, you know, frankly, there is a price for, our attitude is there is a price for everything. And if, the, if, if Russian stock had gotten to be so cheap, and maybe they will be, uh, we would be, you know, I don't know about my successor, but I would be, you know, willing at least to to look at a few. So I'm, I have no, uh, you know, I understand that uh, that uh, sometimes I say to myself that from a very long term standpoint, maybe India is the most attractive uh, country for an investor, more than China, more so than China, because in China, it's, it's too, to my mind, it's too much of a command economy. Uh, uh, and, and, and with, with the idea that you're the party that's in charge, I'm not saying that they're gangsters, but uh, but uh, I mean there is corruption also in India. There is no doubt about it. But uh, uh, but you know the people in, at the helm in China, they know that if if they were to stop providing. Uh, uh, you know, if the economy were to slow down in a major way, they'd be out, or there would be all sorts of upheaval. Uh, so, uh, well, in, in a democracy like, like India, uh, you know, politicians understand that every now and then they have to make room for the other party, or that, uh, you know, if there is a recession while they are in power, well, maybe the, the, the other party will take over. Uh, it takes place in a no, somewhat normal way. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm not at all, and, and, but I understand as well that there are European, American, and Japanese companies that have substantial exposure, that you know, buying, buying securities in emerging markets, there is also securities in, in Europe, in, 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 in the U.S., and in Japan, uh, which have considerable exposure to emerging countries. Um, having worked extensively in both France and North America, have you noticed a difference in investing philosophies? I came to the U.S. because there was a professional opportunity that did not exist in France, and I stayed for the same reason. Uh, I think France is... Uh, I think the, uh, the business world is less clubby than it used to be uh, when I was working there. Uh, there has been over the past 10 or 15 years successes of entrepreneurs who came from nowhere. Some of them had not even gone to college, which was very unusual in France. Uh, but still, I mean, the, uh, the, opportunities are, uh, the opportunities were better for me than, uh, than they would have been in France. I noticed, uh, I was reading through your Wikipedia page earlier on today, uh, and I noticed that you had a quote there about, about gold. Uh, right. Yes. Uh, yeah, let me say a few words about gold. It, it has quite a bit to do with, I should have mentioned it at the time, with the idea that, uh, that there is a possibility that the economic and financial landscape of the post World War II period does not apply anymore. Indeed, as you know, the, the steps taken by the Central Bank of the, by the Federal Reserve are completely unprecedented in the history of the Federal Reserve, going back to 1913 when it was created. 
Incidentally, there was a, there was in, in the New York Times a couple of years ago, uh, a human interest story, which goes to show that as an investor, one should read uh, not just about financial stuff, but almost everything, uh, which talked about a man who was 99 years old, and he all his life he, he had been uh, a barber, cut men's hair, and he still uh, came to the barber shop in Queens or Brooklyn uh, once or twice a week and cut men's hair. And he added uh, that uh, he had been working since the age of 14, and of course the human interest was related to how many among us will work for 85 years. Uh, and, and, and towards the end, and without any comment by either himself or by the, um, or by the journalist, uh, he said, I charged 85 years ago, I charged 25 cents a haircut. Today, I charge $12 a haircut, which by New York City standards is cheap. Uh, but my point is 25 cents 85 years ago bought you a haircut. Today, 25 cents buys you nothing. Maybe a piece of bubble gum, and I'm not sure. So it has coincided with the existence of the Federal Reserve, so the currency has been debased, sometimes fairly quickly, because that was the World War II, and inflation always increases during wars. Uh, inflation in the 70s, sometimes slowly, but the currency has been debased. And when you look back, there was the classical gold standard up until World War I. After World War I, there was a softer version, the gold exchange standard. After World War II, there was the even softer version, which was called the um, the uh, no the Bretton Woods Agreement. Bretton Woods Agreement, and in 1971, I remember because it was in August 1971, and with friends we were renting for the summertime. We were renting a beach house uh, on Long Island, and. I was watching TV, we were about to, to head back to, uh, to Manhattan, and, and here was Nixon, uh, Nixon, a Republican, mind you, saying, well, we're closing the gold window. The, 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 the Biden Woods Agreement was an extremely soft version of the gold standard. The, the, you and I could not, uh, you know, if we had dollars, we could not bring them to, uh, to the authorities and say, give me gold in exchange. But if you were a country and you had dollars, you could bring, you had dollars because you had exported a lot of stuff to, to the U.S. You could go to, uh, to the gold, so-called gold window and exchange your dollars for gold. And Nixon could see that some countries, including France, were very active in, <laughs> in showing up at the gold window, exchanging their dollars for gold, and he was worried that maybe the gold would completely disappear. And so he closed the gold window. Incidentally, Nixon, the Republican, is also the man who put, put in place uh, uh, price and wage controls in 1971 at the same time, closes the gold window, and then finally says, I'm a Keynesian now. So gold, as the late Peter Bernstein used to say, is protection against extreme outcomes. And the, the history of, uh, of pure paper, basically since 1971, for 40 years, we have been in a pure paper money, fiat money, as they say, system. And the history of pure paper money systems is not inspiring. The, uh, the French and the Germans know it well, the Germans particularly because they remember the Weimar Republic in the early 20s with hyperinflation. And the French, it happened in the 19th century at the beginning when the... Uh, Louis XIV, the Sun King, had waged so many wars and spent so much money building castles and everything that the, the, the treasury, French treasury was broke and uh, there was a period of regency before Louis XV became king and the regent was uh, hobnobbed with a, a Scottish adventurer who uh, created substantial uh, inflation in, in, in France. And then in the late 19th, Century, uh, the, uh, the, the, 
the clergy, the assets of the clergy had been confiscated by the revolutionaries. Uh, the, those assets were mostly land and buildings. That's what wealth was all about, basically, at the time. And the, the state needed money. The state was woke. And uh, they issued bonds with a collateral, uh, with assets of the clergy, confiscated assets of the clergy as collateral. Uh, but the, the bond issue, issue was so successful that they multiplied the issues. Towards the end, there was no collateral to speak of, and th there was enormous inflation as well. And indeed, Napoleon came in in order to clean up the mess to a large extent. Okay, thank you. So, 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 it, so it's, it's gold as, you know, last year, Bitcoin prices went up and the price of gold went down. To me, it's a complete puzzle. Bitcoin is a joke, and gold is not a joke. Gold has been money for thousands of years. And I'm not saying that we're going back to the gold standard. Probably not, because politicians, you know, the, the reason why the classical standard was, gold standard was abandoned, and the reason why the Federal Reserve was created in 1913 was that there, there were a brief, because the thing with the classical gold standard was that every now and then, a country would run into trouble, but the trouble was painful but brief because there were considerable constraints associated with the gold standard. With pure paper money, there is no real constraint except the trust that people have in their government. And one characteristic today, it seems to me, not just in the U.S. but throughout the world, is elites are discredited, including the Chinese elites. Okay, thanks. Hi, John. Thank you for speaking with us today. Uh, when picking stocks using the value investing perspective, do you feel as if there's a specific part of the analysis that's most prone to error? So put another way, do you feel as if value investors tend to get wrong a specific part of the analysis? Like the you know, mistakes are unavoidable. Uh, because of the search for the margin of safety, I think value investors tend to make fewer mistakes overall than other investors. Uh, and I, I don't know how to call the uh, you know other investors, momentum investors, closet indexers. Um, yeah, I think they tend to make because of the emphasis on the, on the margin of safety, tend to make fewer uh, fewer mistakes. What do you think made made you a great investor? What was your competitive advantage? You, you know, I was at a wedding uh, a couple of years ago. Well, Seth Carmen of the Balpos Group was at the wedding as well because it was a wedding of one of uh, Jim Grant's daughters. And I was sitting at the same table with Seth, and Seth told me he thought he had two advantages over other professional investors. One, he was a value investor, which I am too, and his second advantage, which I don't have because I'm in the mutual fund world, is that he started out, when he started out, I think, on his own 25 years ago or so or more, 30 maybe, um, he, uh, I think he, he, his major investors were two or three family offices. And family offices tend to be more patient than other investors. After all, the role of the family office is to, be, before all, preserve the capital of the family. That, yes, if the capital can be increased, fine, but the first order of the day is to preserve the capital, preservation of capital. And, and and then he did well for a long period of time, and uh, and most of the time he's close to new investors. And when he reopens, uh, he told me uh, he's very polite. But there are investors he takes in, and investors to whom potential investors he takes in, invest, potential investors he politely says no to them, because he's not sure or he's not really confident that they have the same that they have the same patience that he has. And I think that's, uh, that you know, eliminates uh, to a large extent you know, career risk. It makes be being a value investor easier, less difficult. Right? But I think my, my advantage is I am a value investor. I, I believe that you know, it's, a, it's a genuine advantage. Okay, and the last question is, uh, what is the biggest lesson you learned in investing and in life over the last 40 years? 
It's a lesson I learned in the late 90s. It's really painful to lag. <laughs> to lag for a long period is really painful. I mean, the, uh, there was a reward eventually, but uh, there were days in 99 when I came home in the evening and uh, I said, I, I must be an idiot. I mean, there is something that other people see which I don't seem to see and I must be an idiot. Uh, 